Well, hi, good afternoon, everybody. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Trail Talk. That's right, the much anticipated second made you wait in a, our series of chiefs of the plains tribes right. is finally here <laughs> no i did part do, do. <laughs> uh no internet difficulties today mm -hmm. so welcome to trail talk we're glad you could join us we're in our classroom studio i'm edie and i'm mary and we are live in duncan oklahoma at the chisholm trail heritage center and uh, you know, this is this is a kind of a an interesting uh, series. It is, especially this one. Right. There's a lot of um, action. There. Yes. Yes. Action. Yes. That's good. Uh, we're only going to um, talk about three mm -hmm. chiefs today. There are probably uh, men whose names you yeah, will probably recognize or well known. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they they definitely play mm -hmm. a big role in history. Oh, for sure. Um, especially, well, I mean, as where like U.S. history meets the Native American history, right. um, <clears throat> because prior to that, it would have been more their tribal history and those and kinds of really things, right? Feelings with them. Right. Yeah. Um, so sure. this is kind of where these two worlds are really starting to collide, mm -hmm. and um, the 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 treaty slash uh, raids slash military force yeah. slash forced removal <laughs> days are upon us yes. in in this very part. Nice. Yeah, in this part of um, history. And so today, the first of these great chiefs we're going to talk about is Crazy Horse. Oops, that skipped a picture. There we go. There's Crazy Horse. Um, Crazy Horse uh, did, I mean, he's very well known. Yes, that name's very well known. There's a lot of information about him, mm -hmm. and yet he was a young man. Yes, when he died. very young. He was. Born in South Dakota in 1841. Yes, yes. Um, so I mean, he he did so much in just yes. a short number of years. So much was uh, uh, um, I don't know, just distinction, and so had so much influence. He did so much influence for such a young and man. Fought, I think that's he thought the, hard. Yes, yeah. He was a, a strong warrior. Mm -hmm. um, strong beliefs. Yes, so he was born to an Oglala Sioux shaman, and um, <clears throat> he had a lighter complexion, and so as a young boy, they called him light-haired boy, and his hair was kind of curly, mm -hmm. and um, so he was just, I guess he stood out right, among like, his yeah, people, yeah. that's that's what I was kind of yeah. thinking of the information meant. Um, he earned the name His Horse Looking um but his father was named crazy right, horse. Was um but his father later took the name worm and at that time mm -hmm. crazy horse took his father's right. name N naming children in this uh the sioux, sioux uh tribal culture mm -hmm. um was similar to um i mean the only the only thing i know right. is like a hebrew culture where they would name the child for something that occurred or something they saw in the child, not a birth name. Right. Okay. That birth name didn't all oh, didn't necessarily stick. stick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would change their name with a significant event, life event. Right. So kind of, I mean, not to downplay anything, but like dances with wolves. Yes. Like he was his name was given to him mm -hmm. for what they noticed or right. Yeah. Well, the woman was <clears throat> named Stans mm -hmm. with mist clenched, mm -hmm. and that was right. Reference for referenced her right. personality. Yeah, that's a that's a good analogy for us. Our of comparison. Um, so he wasn't big with all the tribal customs mm -hmm. and and things of that time, which I find um, interesting. So like rebellion and thinking outside mm -hmm. the the ways of your people. Her, perhaps it's not so new with teenagers, <laughs> right? Um, Been around, yeah, and not. Uh, you know, to the uh, uh, civilized right cultures. Rules are there to be broken, no matter <laughs> exactly, no matter who you are or mm -hmm. where you're from. I I, I find that to be very interesting. <laughs> um, but 
he did kind of do a ritual of sorts in 1854. So what would he have been? 13, uh, no, 23. So, no, 13. So he was 13. Uh -huh. Young by our yes. standards. Yes, very young. He went off, fasted for two days, and had a vision of an unadorned horseman who directed him to present himself in the same way with no more than one feather and never a war bonnet to toss dust over his horse before entering battle and to place a stone behind his ear mm -hmm. and to never take anything for himself. And Crazy Horse did that his entire life. Mm -hmm. And you'll see this that picture of him, this, I mean, this could have been about the time mm -hmm. of this vision. He looks like a teenager mm -hmm. to me. I mean, yeah, he was old when he passed. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And this picture, this next one, this is of him. You can tell there later. He's more, he's more mature. His face has been developed. More angular and everything. But look, one feather. One feather. Uh, this was a something he took, literally took it to heart and always Follow. um, followed that. Good. Um, so in 1866, he would have been 25 at this time. Mm -hmm. Gold was found in Montana and thus set forth the invasion of the white settlers in the northern plains of <clears throat> what well, of the United States. Yeah. There. And because so many um U.S. citizens, because remember, at this time, Native Americans were not considered citizens right. of the United right. States. Um, U.S. citizens were moving up there, you know, in search of gold, 1866. So, I mean, in 1849 was when the California gold rush happened. So uh, maybe some of these were people coming back. Right. Right. You could have been out. Yeah, already been there, done that. Yeah, back. the minor 49er is now coming back. I don't have a rhyme for the 66 guys. But anyway, a, a, a general whose name might be familiar, William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, was sent up there to build forts in Sioux territory to give protection to the uh, gold seekers. Mm -hmm. And um, of course there were clashes always. And this particular, there's this event that's described in this research. Um, a troop, one of the troops clashed with Sioux and Cheyenne warriors after Crazy Horse acted as a decoy to lead the 80 white soldiers to their death in an ambush. Now I was uh, telling Mary about a year ago, I listened, I had liked to listen to Audible. I listened to a book by um, Bill O'Reilly, yeah, called, uh, it was one of his uh, killing series of books. It was called Killing Crazy Horse. And it described this particular battle. I mean, Crazy Horse. They ended up packed up and sent as a message. Yes, like body parts. Mm -hmm. So Sherman. Um, it was Crazy Horse drew those men out. There might have been one or two amongst them who thought, what? what's going on? But he led them down into a low place mm. where the uh, the warriors were up high. And you know, go. when you give up the high ground, <laughs> I'm thinking of the Star Wars, but, <laughs> you know, Darth Vader thing. Um, but the, uh, when you give up the high ground, you're setting yourself up. And I mean, the, they just, it was bad. It was a really bad battle. I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, so then the following year, Crazy Horse took part in another attack on a smaller fort. Um, in the next year, the soldiers were pulled out of this area and a treaty was signed to give the native people ownership of the Black Hills up there, South Dakota and all West that. Missouri. Yeah, West of Missouri, land in mm -hmm. Wyoming. And no whites would be allowed to enter that territory under threat of arrest. But <laughs> Crazy Horse not willing to always, you know, go with the flow. Right. He had his stipulation. Yeah. Um, he can kept doing Native. raids, but it was on uh, other Native American right. people. Right. Right. Um, he uh, he eventually married a woman named Black Shawl. She died of tuberculosis, and he later married a half Cheyenne, half French woman named Nellie Larrabee. But um, 
all the while, Crazy Horse is just a part of this He's raid. Yes. Yeah, they're, you know, they're, they follow buffalo herds, they raid, and they're just, um, I mean, I don't know if you would describe him as angry or if he was just um, about keeping, I, I mean, there was probably this right. tension yes. all the time of uh, we're losing land. Mm -hmm. uh, we're being pushed out. And I mean, 1872. I thought that like his back was against the wall. Like he had like a defenseless animal. Oh, almost in a way. yes. You know, yes. like in a trap. Yes, exactly. And trying to fight and get up. And 1872, mm -hmm. I mean, Indian territory is getting filled up mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Yes. yes. Um, and I'm sure he sees the writing is on the wall mm -hmm. for right. them. Even though the Sioux are, are not in Indian, Indian territory, mm -hmm. it's obvious that um, gaining control over and, and it's closing, it. closing them in, mm -hmm. yeah, putting them in a restricted area. Right. Anyway, um, he, in 1872, well, it wasn't just gold rushes either. Uh, railroads, mm -hmm. huge impact on uh, more white settlers moving across the country. I'm, I'm thinking the, uh, what was it called? The Transcontinental Railroad, uh -huh. you know, it's more up north, mm -hmm. probably very yeah. close to the yeah. area. I don't know that uh, for sure, but I'm guessing it's very close to the area where Crazy Horse had lived. Um, anyway, uh, Crazy Horse, uh, ran into someone else whose name you may be familiar with, General George Armstrong Custer. And uh, Custer, what, Crazy Horse encountered him and some napping soldiers and attempted to steal their horses, but failed. Crazy Horse retreated, which was really all Custer needed. <laughs> I, I sometime will do a little <laughs> story because Custer actually led a raid here in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to be studying some of that, but he is very interesting. And it just takes one little thing like that for him <laughs> to him be, you're on his list. Yeah, yeah. you just crossed the line. Um, anyway, uh, they they gather, I'll just say the Little Bighorn River. <laughs> and I think you know the rest yeah. of the story. Right. Um, but there was one battle before that where Crazy Horse and Sitting, Sitting Bull led uh, forces to what was called the Battle of Rosebud, which the Native people were victorious in that battle. And then shortly after that came Little Bighorn. And that particular event, as told in uh, Killing Crazy Horse, is, I mean, it is something that led as many as a thousand. Yeah, there. that um just the description of all of the um the military uh what do you call Fort. them the the different groups of soldiers they have names and like the outfits or the yeah you know, like the divisions yeah or yeah divisions mm -hmm. and stuff like that so there you know they think they have a battle strategy mm -hmm. that will outwit the natives the native americans and yet <laughs> little do they know you have crazy horse who was this um, I don't know if he was as much a, a military mind as he was, had no fear right. of battle. Yeah. He had no fear of battle. People like that, you're not going to stop. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many are coming against you. He may have a thousand to one and he's still going to go at it. Yeah. And um, he, that attitude that um, it inspired others oh, to sure. go with him and to sure. follow him. Um, so anyway, as you know, Custer's last stand was the Little Bighorn. Um, Crazy Horse, they, he went to harass miners in the Black Hills. A, a General Crook was like after him. It, it's a very hard winter follows this mm -hmm. battle uh, of the Little Bighorn. And Crazy Horse is, um, he, sent he sent emissaries to talk to the military, they were shot and killed. Um, Crazy Horse takes off. He's trying to keep his people together. Um, anyway, there was a Lieutenant Philo Clark who offered the starving Sioux their own reservation 
in exchange for surrender. Mm -hmm. And Crazy Horse agreed for that. So there were negotiations and um, this Philo Clark tried to convince Crazy Horse to go to Washington to um, probably to have a better dealing. I mean, there was, um, I, I, I won't say this was across the board, but um, Indian agents and people who made treaties representatives they weren't always of um, high moral character. Okay, because so they could, I mean, further in, they could translate whatever they want. Right. Say so they said whatever. Right. And um, so there was a disadvantage. Right. And I think that Lieutenant Clark maybe was trying to get mm -hmm. Crazy Horse to take full advantage of all the help he could get by yeah. going to Washington. Yes. Um, and he wouldn't, and so the army, the military, I mean, we have the, we have our government, and mm -hmm. then we have the military, mm -hmm. and sometimes the military would do their, uh, like, make, they had to make battlefield decisions. And so ask for forgiveness instead of permission type thing. Yes, that is something that happened frequently. And so, um, you know, the, it was like two different Groups like we talked about the Plains tribes the first week, mm -hmm. how they had all these different chiefs, mm -hmm. and not every chief could speak for right. the whole tribe, and yet sometimes they did. Right. But these uh, bands would break off and mm -hmm. say, "Wait a minute, you don't, yeah. you're not speaking, speaking for, me. for me." And um, I feel like that's kind of how it was the with the the army versus the government. Government, government you know, yeah. it was kind of right. like that to a degree. Um. Anyway. So some of the other Sioux were getting upset because there was a rumor that Crazy Horse was making friends with the white people and uh, that, that the, the army was going to put him in charge, in charge right. but he wasn't that cheap. He, no. They didn't feel like that's what we were just talking about. Um, so tensions rose. Then there was the conflict, conflict of the army versus the Nest Purse. Indians and um, an interpreter at, claimed that Crazy Horse had promised he would not stop fighting until all the not white men were killed, even though Crazy Horse never yeah. said that. And that's the thing that yeah. you mentioned. Right. Um, uh, interpretation. Yes, the interpreters needed to be solid mm -hmm. and not be. Um, don't you know, not live or do you know, and don't be influenced or don't be partial way one way or the other I, i'll just say jesse chisholm was well known for being that kind mm -hmm. of an interpreter yes, yes, i don't yes. know i mean he was more of a southern plains or well it was five civilized tribes maybe um people that he yeah um anyway crazy horse ends up going he signed on with the army or the, some Sioux warriors signed on with the army to fight the Nez Perce. Crazy Horse was so upset about that. He left negotiations, mm -hmm. then he was arrested. They took him to camp. He asked to speak to the military leaders. They put him in a cell. Mm -hmm. And then a quote unquote friend named Little Big Man. I do not know if this is the Little Big Man <laughs> of the Destin Hoffman movie of the 1970s, but I'm going to look into She's that. that I'm looking into it. I grew up watching that movie and I am going to find out. Um, anyway, Little Big Man uh, came in, worked for the army as a policeman, tried to restrain Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse had a little concealed weapon. Um, he tried to, the, a soldier tried to keep Crazy Horse from stabbing Little Big Man and stabbed Crazy Horse with a bayonet, pierced his kidneys. Um, he refused to get on a cot, laid on the floor, asked for his father, and died in 1877 at the age of 35 on a bare floor in Fort Robinson, Nebraska. Yeah. Um, they later took his body and buried it some in an unknown, unmarked grave at Wounded Knee. Um, but the legend of Crazy Horse, I mean, it's, it's not a made-up story. Um, but he was just a, a young man mm -hmm. with determination. Determination. Yes. Mm -hmm. No fear. Fierce. Yeah. It just it reminds me of like those those little punching bags you used to have when you yes, come back at it. And my mommy comes, you hit it. And this is him. He's just yeah. coming back every yeah. time. Exactly. And so next, we're going to talk about someone that Crazy Horse knew well, mm -hmm. fought with, stood with, 
Sitting Bull, also of the Sioux tribe. Um, he was uh, all, you know, at the Battle of Little Bighorn and all that, but he was the son of a renowned Sioux warrior named Returns Again, which makes you think maybe he went to battle and just, right. you know, yeah. he just kept- There he is again. Down. And he mm -hmm. named it, it named him his son Jumping Badger until after um, his, oh, yeah, he killed his first buffalo and his father renamed him to Tonka Yatonka or Sitting Bull for his bravery. They said he was bet somewhere between 10 and 14. Mm -hmm. When he did that. Can you imagine killing a buffalo at that age? No, no. Um, so then he joined the Strong Heart Warrior Society and the Silent Eaters, a group that ensured the welfare of the tribe. So I don't know, maybe these were like the uh, Green Berets. Yeah. Or something, Some you know, they had prestige. Yeah, maybe. Uh -huh, a prestigious, but then also if they were given the responsibility of protecting the tribe, uh, you know, maybe they were fierce Mm. or or had strong military mind right. or some kind of they were uh like outside the box they were able to contribute yes exactly um and uh he helped expand the Sioux uh hunting grounds and um he first battled with the US army in 1863 in uh retaliation uh let's see the oh, there was a Minnesota uprising which sparked federal mm -hmm. agents to withhold food from the Sioux who were living on reservations on the Minnesota River. Over 300 Sioux were arrested. But President Abraham Lincoln, yeah, yeah he um, uh, commuted all, all but 39 right. of those um, people. I mean, withholding food, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and then in 1864, the Battle of Kildare Mountain, Sitting Bull faced off U.S. military again. Um, they, they, these constant battles, though, mm -hmm. uh, convinced Crazy Horse that signing a treaty yeah. would be a good idea. But not all mm -hmm. of the Sioux agreed. They did not see Crazy Horse as their all-in-all -all leader. Right. And... Um, so in 1868, uh, Red Cloud um, signed the Fort Laramie Treaty with 24 other tribal leaders and U.S. representatives, including William sure. Tecumseh Sherman, and it created the Great Sioux Reservation and earmarked additional land for the Sioux in parts of South Dakota, Wyoming, and Nebraska. So Crazy Horse, I mean, Sitting Bull is kind of now at odds mm -hmm. with these Sioux. Um, he was made the supreme leader of the autonomous bands yeah. of the Lakota Sioux. <laughs> so that means they had kind of pulled themselves away from right. these other like groups. of division. Yeah. He was the first one to ever hold that title. Also. Yes. And uh, Arapaho and Cheyenne joined up mm -hmm. with them. We had the the Fort Laramie Treaty was pretty short-lived, though. Nobody ever really was able to, I guess, fully implement the agreements. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, then, you know, the gold was discovered. <laughs> There's gold in the Nar Hills. That's the most one of the yeah. year. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the U.S. government reneged on the treaty that had set aside the land for the Sioux, the Great Sioux the Reservation. There There's gold there. Um, so they had to, uh, they, any Sioux who dared to resist or redraw reservation lines, um, or they had, or what they demanded that any Sioux who dared resist move to the new reservation mm -hmm. or be considered an enemy of the United States. And Sitting Bull was expected to move everyone in his village 240 miles mm -hmm. in bitter cold in January mm -hmm. up in. Wyoming or Montana or whatever. Give them a mission impossible. Yeah. So Sitting Bull refused. Um, he mustered a force that took on General George Crook, who also encountered a uh, crazy horse, won the victory at the Battle Rose of the Rosebud, mm -hmm. and then moved to the Little Bighorn. And again, we know what happened there. Um, so uh, Sitting Bull was considered a holy man. 
So he was one of the spiritual chiefs. Mm -hmm. And he participated in something called a sun dance ceremony where he famously danced for 36 hours straight and made 50 sacrificial cuts on each arm before he fell into a trance. And when he awoke, he revealed he had a vision of U.S. soldiers falling like grasshoppers from the sky, which he took as to be an omen that they would soon be defeated. And he was correct. I mean, that's just crazy. Yeah, because the little bighorn happened. Mm -hmm. That's all you can say about that. Um, anyway, so after that, of course, the U.S. government was upset and began to hunt down the Sioux. The white settlers are moving into these traditional lands that belong to the Sioux all up there. Um, so Sitting Bull took people up to Canada. Right. In 1877. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, food and resources were scarce. Canada was not really a settled place right. you know obviously if the native americans could just kind of move up there, there's probably trappers and hunters yeah, yeah. people yeah. like that up in there um so his people were starving and he surrendered to the u.s army on july 20th 1881 in exchange for amnesty or his four people. years they were up there yeah he was a prisoner of war for a couple of years before he went to the standing rock reservation Sometimes he was permitted to travel. He like appeared in wild uh, Buffalo Oakley. Bills, Cody's Wild West show. He was friends with Annie Oakley. Mm -hmm. um, he would show up in his regalia. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Here's a picture of him as an older man. Sounds and like a little um, Nelson type yeah, of outfit there. He does, doesn't he? Um, and he, uh, he, was the show's opening act. He signed autographs. He met President Grover Cleveland. Um, but there's always the contingent of people who would mock mm -hmm. him and boo him when mm -hmm. he was on stage. Yep. Um, he left the show when he was 54 years old and never returned. Um, Standing Rock, where he had was living, became a center of controversy when the ghost dance movement started gaining attraction. This was a... Uh, Followers believed the deceased tribe members would rise from the dead along with the killed buffalo and the white people would disappear. So even though it was a very much Arfish. Native American cultural kind of thing, mm -hmm. it seems as though those powers that be, I guess, thought it would cause an uprising. I don't know. I Anyway, oh, yeah. um, so they they were worried, and um, the Indian the Indian police went to arrest Sitting Bull at his cabin. They woke him up in his bed at six a.m. When he refused to go quietly, a crowd gathered. A young man shot a member of the Indian police, and so uh, one of yeah one of the police uh, turned around and shot Sitting Bull in the head and the chest, and he died instantly. Uh, two weeks later, the army massacred 150 Sioux at the Battle of Wounded Knee. And that was the final fight between the federal troops and the Sioux. So anyway, Sitting Bull um, was, again, a great revered leader of the Sioux people and um, just met and others. And, numerous yeah, others. True, Cheyenne, Cheyenne, Arapa, Cheyenne and Arapaho and Notoriety and famous, you know, yeah, the wild fish shows and everything. So he just wanted to live. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact that he um, gave himself for amnesty and mm -hmm. amnesty for his people, he was a great leader. He had a heart for his people. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but one of the um, one of the chiefs that just suffered an untimely death. All right. So uh, now we're going to take a look at Chief Joseph. So his people were the Nez Perce people, and they were actually originally um, the uh, Pacific Northwest. Okay. They lived up in the Pacific Northwest, like Washington right. State, uh, up in all, all mm -hmm. up in there. I keep saying that, and it sounds funny to me. I keep saying all up in there, all up in there. I don't know. That sounds funny when I say that. Um, anyway, so Chief Joseph was a part of a um, a band who were mostly uh, converted to Christianity. His father um, sent him to uh, an, a mission school. 
Um, but the advance of the white settlers after 1850 caused the U.S. to press the Native Americans to surrender their lands and accept resettlement. Sounds familiar? Right. Um, the let's second see. verse, same as the first. Yeah. Uh, so he was born in 1840. So he and Crazy Horse were just about the same, same age. age. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, when he was, was 41. Crazy yeah. When was Sitting Bull? For some reason, I felt like he was older. Sitting Bull was born in 1831. 31. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, so some of the Nez Perce chiefs, including Chief Joseph's father, questioned the validity of the treaties um, that were negotiated between 1855 and 1863 because the chiefs who participated did not represent, represent the tribe. Uh -huh. This was an ongoing misunderstanding that yes. led to so much, I don't know, just maybe hostility and yes. just trust issues out there. I mean, and it, was, trust anybody. it was a lack of communication. Maybe it was a lack of understanding or the attempt to understand mm -hmm. right. the way tribal um, peoples, uh, while the way they were set up within yeah, just the, a little bit more a little more, a few more steps in yeah. preparing the way, or looking into how it, they lived. And, yeah, know. so uh, the U.S. attempted in 1877 to force the Nez Perce to move to a reservation in Idaho, and Chief Joseph, this is the younger of the two, um, succeeded his father in 1871, so reluctantly, he re reluctantly agreed, um, but while he was preparing, he heard about uh, three young men who had massacred a band of white settlers and prospectors. And so he was afraid they they're going to come back and retaliate on all of us. It was three lo loners, mm -hmm. or, you know, like you'd call the wolves, loafers. It was three, right. you know, who right. took off and did this on their mm -hmm. own. Um, and so he decided to lead his small body of follow followers, which was just two or three hundred warriors in their family. Right. So probably... Maybe maybe a thousand people. Yeah, total. maybe. Um, they were going to go to Canada. Sitting Bull mm -hmm. had made that his way up there. Yeah. So for more than three months, he Jane led September. his followers um, 1,700 miles across Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana. So three months was typically how long a cattle drive was, and that was to go a thousand and miles. And they also had to, you know, outsmart the troops that were right behind them. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and who outnumbered yeah. a ratio of at least 10 to one. Mm -hmm. um, they had direct combat with the troops the whole time. Um, and, but many white people really admired him for what he was doing. It, I don't think it wasn't that it he was, was causing it was even fear. then. <laughs> I mean, really, I feel like he was just trying to take his people to mm -hmm. somewhere else to live where right. they felt like they would be safe and not accused of things. And um, but but the military and perhaps acting on the the orders of the U.S. government right. uh, were supposed to um, take them in. I don't know if prisoner, but at least confine them. Um, he would purchase supplies from ranchers and storekeepers and not steal. Mm -hmm. He paid money. Now, remember, he's educated. Mm -hmm. He is yeah, an educated he's like man. Right. Uh, I feel like he probably spoke very plain English. Right. He was able to communicate, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, anyway, they finally sur uh, surrendered, I think. Surrounded? They were surrounded. In oh, their, they were. The some, yeah, they were finally surrounded in the Bear Paw Mountains. Of Montana within three miles. Can you imagine going 1,700 miles and you're just right there? Probably just two days travel. Mm -hmm. And October 5th, Chief Joseph surrendered, delivering an eloquent speech that was long remembered. I do not, I did not find this, do the speech, but um, here is Chief Joseph later in life. Um, he and his band were sent to a barren reservation in Indian Territory where they all. They almost all died. Um, and in 1885, they were allowed to go back to Washington, even though they still were in exile from the valley where his people had lived right. for thousands of years. Um, Chief Joseph made two trips to Washington, D.C., where he presented President Theo to Theodore Roosevelt 
when he was presented to Theodore Roosevelt, he pled for the return of his people to their ancestral home. He said, um, okay, this speech, here it is. There's a lot of it. Uh, um, he said, it is cold and we have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people, some of them have run away to the hills and have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are, perhaps freezing to death. I want to have time to look for my children and see how many I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs, I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. Oh, man. Right? Man. I mean, that is incredibly eloquent. It's one of the most famous speeches of the American West. Um, but he, uh, he was just very beloved by all people, uh, respected. Um, there, of course, were those people who lived near him uh, who might, may have felt. I think there was always this um, feeling of uncertainty of when Native American people were close to white settlers. Just like that. I mean, those three people did a massacre and they had to go on the run just because yeah. they were Native American. Yes, exactly. And 10,000 troops ensued after them. Right. So finally in 1900, Chief Joseph received permission to return to Wallowa to make his case before the Valley's white settlers. He told a large crowd he had never sold the land and now wished to reclaim some of it near his father's burial. Um, of course, he was met with jeers. They considered him sentimental and delusional and expressed no willing to sell the land to him. Um, he was, uh, let's see, he passed away in 1904. He had an undiagnosed illness. Um, uh, he was invited to do speeches and all sorts of things over all of this time. But he asked his wife to get his headdress because he said, I wish to die as a chief. And soon after his journey was over. So, I mean, three, three renowned yes. leaders yes. among amazing many stories, amazing. amazing stories of bravery and commitment and just desperation. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, and just yeah. pure down belief in, in yeah. survival. Survival, yeah. Um, great leaders, probably a lot we could learn from the way they they thought and the way they led and um you know just how we learn from leaders mm -hmm. when we live you know in the past. Uh, so, um chief joseph uh, yes chief joseph a very eloquent yes eloquent speaker yes. anyway we hope you guys have learned a little bit about yep. these uh some of these leaders the wait right exactly <laughs> yeah we're gonna take uh a look at, at a few more of these great men in history next week so be sure and join us then and tomorrow melissa smith is going to be here she's going to do a cool jewelry demonstration on this new technique she's using you know she has the little movement jewelry yes. so uh be sure and tune in and join us then and um we'll see you guys next time happy, happy trails, trails.